camera. Good morning, good morning. So we have a live crew today, and um, Terry wasn't able to help with music today. We couldn't find a villain, so we found Mary and she counts. And so <laughs> Mary's going to be playing piano, and I'm going to help lead the song. And please join in. Yeah, so sing, sing loud. Sing solos all the whole service. So, um, but Mary, take it away whenever you're ready. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in him, and be glad in him. This is the day that the Lord has made. I think we should sing it again. Yeah, one more time. <laughs> and just so you know, we have not been able to practice. We so we're not. just giving it our best shot. So I think we should sing it again because you guys know this song. Here we go. <laughs> a little let's see technology here we go okay so um this weekend is when they're having the 20th annual quilting in the pines retreat um that's up at cane ridge west i'm not sure what the cutoff date is for registration but i would bet that if you haven't registered they probably still welcome you um so if you're interested in going to that quilting retreat this weekend the 8th to 11th talk to susie rebeck about that she can get you signed up and you can go for as many days as you're able. You don't have to be able to go for the entire retreat. Um, we're also still having the study at Perkins every week. We're going to be doing Hebrews 12 this week, 13 next week, and then we'll start a whole new study. So that's at 10 o'clock Thursday mornings at Perkins. Uh, we have an elders dinner on Tuesday. It's going to be down in the fellowship hall and a carry in or potluck style. So if you uh, are an elder, don't forget to come to that. Um, or come on Zoom, whichever you're more comfortable with. And then the last thing is that I'm going to be on vacation next Sunday. So we'll have Gloria filling the pulpit, which will be very exciting. So that's always fun to have different uh, fresh perspectives. So any other announcements that we need to make known today? Anything at all? Okay. Well, if not, then please join me in our opening prayer. God of all nations, we thank you for bringing us all together here in this place. Remind us that we were each made in your image, and as a result, we are all equal in your eyes. Help us to celebrate the great gift of diversity. Though we are unique, you have called us to be one and to be united in service and in love. Though we are one, we are not the same, and thanks be to God for that. Amen. Okay, our next song is In This Very Room, which I have not sung since I was a small girl, so let's try it. <laughs> Quite enough joy for one like me, and there's quite enough love and quite enough love to 
this garden of joy for all us. And this garden of love, and garden of love to chase away any evil. For Jesus, Lord Jesus, is in this very in this very room, there's quite a fall for all of us. This is me. There's quite a fall for all of us. changed since the last time I sang that. I can't sing as high as I used to. So. Okay. Do you want the mic pack or do you want? Okay. So hello everybody. I have some numbers here. I think you can come out closer for me. And see this table. The lady was wrong. The table is empty. Huh. Well, what usually goes on this table? Can you remember? Communion. communion goes on this table. And what are the parts of communion? What are the things do we need? Do we need pickles? No, no, no. no there's not pickles on communion. At least not this week. What, what do we usually have? Bread. bread. Beckett says we have bread. And what else do we have? What did brother spell all over? Yeah, what did we Juice. We need bread and juice. Well, today's a very, very special day. Today is called World Communion Sunday. You know what the big world is, right? And there's countries all around the world. And today, all around the world, in different countries, Christians are celebrating communion. And we're all doing it together. Do you notice my dress? Does it look kind of different? Yeah, it's kind of. Well, I got this dress in a country called India. And when I was in India, there were Christians there that celebrated communion also. So I need your help. Will you help me set the communion table? Okay. You wait right here. I'll go get my stuff. I'm back. Okay, so I have this bag. It's a beautiful bag. This is from a country called Nicaragua. And that's south of us. It's a very warm country. And in this bag, I have some things we're going to use on the communion table. So the first thing I have, we're going to cover this table with some pretty cloths. So this first cloth comes from a country called Comoros. And it's, it's an island. It's close to Africa. Could you go put this on that side of the table? Okay, you go put that one up. And then we have another cloth And this cloth is from the country of the Philippines. You might be catching a little um, common thread here, grown-up friends. This is from the Philippines. It's a country that has thousands of islands, and it's a very hot place. Delaney, can you put that on in the middle part? Pretty. Oh, good job. They're kind of slippery. Okay, we have one more. And this cloth comes from a country called Ethiopia. Isn't that pretty? Can you two girls go and put it on this end? There you go. Okay. Oh, they're doing such a good job. And we started right here. There you go. Perfect. Okay, now we've got the table coverings from different countries, but you said that we need bread, right? 
Well, before we have bread, we have to have a plate. So we have this plate. Can, can you read those words, Mama? No. no. <laughs> Lord Jean, can you read those words? Uh, it's kind of like really scripted. It's very scriptable. Well, this, this is a plate from Romania. Oh. But actually, the language on the plate is Hungarian, and it's a blessing. And I don't remember how to read all the blessing, but it's a blessing that says, in your house, may God always be with you. So this is God's house. Um, Delaney, you want to very carefully set that on the communion table? Okay. Now we need some bread. Let's see what I have in my bag here. I have some different kinds of bread. Look at this size of bread. Is that a big piece of bread? Yeah. It is a huge piece of bread. In fact, there's actually two pieces of bread in here. I'm going to have Delaney hold the mic for a minute. Okay. All right. So we have this piece of bread. Reese, what does that look like? Does that look like a taco? Yeah. yeah. Reese, could you go? This is from Mexico. Could you go put this tortilla on that plate? Oh, thank you, Reese. Oh, good job. Good job. You did it. Okay, come on down. All right, and then we have this big, big fat one. It kind of looks like a taco shell, but it's much thicker and spongy. This is called naan, and this is bread from India. Can you put that on the on the plate? Plate's kind of small, so you just kind of have to lay them side by side. Okay. And then we have this one. Yeah. yeah, we have, and it's kind of a, a baguette. And lots of places in Europe make this kind of bread. So Delaney, you want to put this one on there? Okay, so we have our bread, we have our table covers. What's the one thing we are missing? A cup. A cup. So uh, I'm going to have Delaney go over there. There's a cup. And this chalice happens to be one that was made in Montana. Yeah, so Delaney's going to carry it over, and she's just going to put it right up on the communion table. This is a chalice that was made in near Whitehall, Montana. It's calico, calico pottery. So we have something from Montana and from places all around the world. So it's very important for us to remember that we're not the only ones that do communion, are we? There are people all over the world. Will you say a prayer with me? Dear God. Thank you for loving us and for sending us your son. And thank you for showing us that your love encircles the entire world. In your precious name, amen. I have some papers over at the table and some other kinds of bread that you can enjoy during church. Hi again. Our, our scripture this morning is one of my favorites, and there are a lot of songs um, that we sing that are from this scripture, and it's from 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 through 17, then 31 through 33. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. The word of God for the people of God. So you may have gathered um, based on Mary's children's sermon or all of the decorations in the sanctuary, that today is a very special day in the life of the church. Today is World Communion Sunday. It's a day when we recognize our unity with believers from all around the world who join us at this same table today. And this has always been one of my favorite 
holy days in the life of the church, um, probably um, because communion has always been my favorite part of worship since I was a little girl. And I know, I know this is a very disciples of Christ thing for me to say. We really love communion. And unlike those in many other religious traditions, um, churches in the Disciples of Christ partake in communion every single Sunday. And even sometimes during the weekdays, if there's some sort of special occasion or a special um, holiday that we're celebrating. We take communion as often as possible because Christ instructed us to remember him in that way every time that we gather. And so we do. Some churches partake in communion only a few times a year, but our founders believed that this should be a weekly practice. So we carry on that tradition in our congregations today. And throughout much of college um, and for a while after graduation, I attended a non-denominational church. And um, there was a lot that I liked about the church, but one thing that I really missed more than anything else was weekly communion. I really missed that part of being a disciple. And at that church, we only took communion quarterly, which is pretty common. Each Sunday, as we approached the end of the worship service, I always had this feeling like there was something big missing or like we were building up to some big moment that just never happened. And as a lifelong disciple, communion was always the climax of worship. Everything in the service built up to that one special moment at the end of worship when we joined Christ at the table, along with all of our other believers. And without that special moment, worship just wasn't exactly the same for me. There was something so grounding and calming about the weekly practice of coming to the table. And I felt that void, that something missing all throughout the week. And it wasn't until I attended a church that took communion much less frequently that I actually came to understand just how much I had taken that weekly communion for granted throughout my youth. If you've ever worked in the business world, um, you may recognize this week as the start of Q4 or the fourth quarter of the year. This is the final quarter of the year when businesses make a really big push to try to meet all of their annual financial goals. And because many churches only partake in communion quarterly, October 3rd is a pretty convenient date for World Communion Sunday um, because most of those quarterly congregations are also partaking in communion today. And the first World Communion Sunday was held in 1933 at a Presbyterian church in Pittsburgh. Um, and it was held in an attempt to bring churches together in a show of Christian unity. The hope was that despite all of our many differences as Christians and the many things that separate us, World Communion Sunday could be a day in which we focus on that which unites us our faith in Christ, rather than all of the many things um, that can cause division in the Christian movement. And World Communion Sunday came about during a time of great uncertainty and unrest. In 1933, the same year, uh, Adolf Hitler was appointed as Chancellor of Germany, and he rapidly began his campaign of violence and hatred and destruction in Europe. And meanwhile, in the United States, uh, we found ourselves in the middle of the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world, um, known now as the Great Depression. This was a time of anxiety and uncertainty about the future. In part, World Communion Sunday was an attempt to rally hope in the midst of such division and fear. This was a day that was created in order to show unity among Christians, despite all of these challenges. And in many ways, the first World Communion Sunday was held on a day that was not unlike today. We too find ourselves in a time of division and uncertainty. We too see these deep rifts continuing to form within our society. These fractures have existed for longer than I could begin to speculate at this moment, but most of us can agree that the pandemic has only increased tensions and frustrations within our community and country. As if we didn't already have enough to disagree on, the pandemic has created this whole new slew of topics to debate and argue over, unfortunately. And I'll just speak for myself when I say that I think I need communion now more than ever before. 
I need this weekly act to ground me and to remind me of my work as Christ's servant in the world. I need this weekly reminder that the things that unite us are stronger than that which divides us. I need to remember that this table is not only for myself or for people who look like me or believe like I do, but for all believers scattered all throughout the world. There is nothing that anyone could ever do that would make them unwelcome at Christ's table. Here at this table, Christ welcomes all. And as Christ followers, we are called not to place barriers around the table or to judge the worthiness of each participant, but just to extend that welcome that Christ first gave to each of us. In seminary, my classmates and I often, oftentimes engaged um, in what I would call, but what about debates. So someone would profess some belief of some kind, and then others would challenge them saying, but what about X? Or, but what if Y happened? Then what? And when the topic of communion came up, there was oftentimes the question of who was actually welcome at the table. One person would pro profess, of course, that all were welcome. And then another person would say, okay, but what about blank type of person? Would they be welcome? What about a murderer or a child abuser or a sex worker or the local leader of the Ku Klux Klan? Who, who's really welcome? And these conversations oftentimes challenged us in ways that we hadn't really expected. It's easy to spout off these simple platitudes like all are welcome, but when push comes to shove, the welcome gets a little harder to stand by. The truth about the table that we always came back to though, and that I always remember today, is that in fact, all really are welcome, including those who we would rather never come face to face with because this is Christ's table, not our own. We don't get to decide. This table and this feast that we partake in every week is not only for those that we have determined are worthy. It's not reserved for those who have behaved well this week or those who believe correctly according to our standards. It's open to all, whether we like that or not. This is an invitation only event, um, but every person in the world is given that special invitation from the savior to join him for this banquet of remembrance. Everyone is on that guest list. No one is forgotten or unaccounted for. And this is both good and very challenging news. If you are someone who has made choices that you really regret, um, choices that may have caused harm to others, or choices that would exclude you from attending many gatherings or being part of many communities, well, congratulations, you're in luck. Nothing could exclude you from this welcome. You're invited just the same and you're still one of us. But if you're someone who has done everything right, at least according to your view of God, um, someone who's read the Bible cover to cover and has done all they can to live according to God's word, well, congratulations, you're in luck. You're invited too, but so are they. The formidable they, right? Those people who fall outside of the realm of acceptability, those you would never invite to your own dinner party, and those you'd never think to possibly accept an invitation from, yeah, they're gonna be at that table too. Do you dare to still come? knowing that this table is for all and not just the chosen few who pass the test. The truth is you and I need forgiveness and connection as much as they do. We all come to this table from different places, carrying unique baggage and a lifetime of different mistakes, but we all equally need to connect with Christ and to remember who we are and why we're here. Together, we all make up the body of Christ. There is no part of us, no matter how broken or how seemingly flawed, that is not, uh, that is not necessary for all of us to be all that we can and to do the work of God in the way we've been called. We need one another, even the parts of the body that sometimes seem a little disposable. No, we need those too. In today's scripture, Paul reminds us of this, saying, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one bread. 
Paul is alluding to the communion practice of each person ripping off a small piece of bread from a common loaf. The loaf represents the body of Christ and our oneness as believers. And though we partake differently today, out of an abundance of caution, uh, we still join believers all around the world in taking a piece from this one big metaphorical loaf and partaking together in remembering Christ, whether that's through one loaf of bread or a million tiny wafers scattered all around the world. The meaning is not found just in the elements that we use, but in our presence at the table and in Christ's presence there with us. In this chapter of 1 Corinthians, there is an ongoing disagreement and debate about how to partake in communion. The community is debating about whether it is lawful or permissible to take it in this way or that way, and then also how they are to handle different sorts of sacrifices. And Paul is attempting to speak a word of unity to a group that is comprised of people from diverse backgrounds and cultures and beliefs and demographics. Paul makes it clear that our unity as believers is more important than having uniform beliefs. As Christ, at Christ's table, the welcome is very wide. Wide enough not only for those who resemble, but for all who want an encounter with the divine, no matter where they're coming from or where they might be going. As I prepared my sermon this week, I found myself thinking of tables at which I have experienced a wide welcome in my lifetime. I thought of the dinner table at my childhood home with my parents, where we would eat dinner together every night as we shared stories about our days and we told all about the things we'd learned at school that day. And I thought of my husband, my husband Kit's grandparents' table, where there is always room for one more person to join um, and always more food than we could possibly eat, including fresh tortillas. They, they always have fresh homemade tortillas. It's amazing. And I remembered also my own grandparents' table. But to call it a singular table wouldn't exactly be very accurate. This was more of an ever-growing table that overflowed from the kitchen into the dining room and then on into the living room as my cousins had more and more children and the family just grew beyond the capacity of one kitchen table. No matter how many leaves we wanted to add into it, we always added leaves and it was never enough. But somehow, even when there was no longer room at the kitchen table or the card table set up next to it, more tables just magically appeared throughout their home and no one ever went hungry, never at grandma and grandpa's house. And not long ago, Kit and I decided that it was time for us to buy a real grown up dining room table of our own. <laughs> We've been married almost five years, but until now we had been using different hand-me-downs from friends who had been upgrading their own dining room sets, which was okay, but it was time. So we started discussing what features we might like in a table, never knowing that it would be such a big topic of conversation. It took a while to decide. And we browsed online and we walked through a few different stores to get an idea of what we really wanted. We ended up at Ashley Furniture, and there were lots of these smaller high top tables with a few stools around them. And then there were little kitchenette tables that were uh, large enough for maybe two or three people and other more compact solutions that probably would have been more logical or realistic for our small apartment. But ultimately we chose one of the largest tables in the showroom. It had a tiny little nick or flaw and so it was discounted, but it was perfect. The table is long and wide with a big bench and lots of other seats. And while we're just a family of two at this point, if you don't count our pets, don't tell them, we knew that we wanted room to grow and space to entertain our loved ones. We knew that the table was where community was experienced and where love was shared and memories were made. We wanted our table to be just like those tables of welcome and plenty that we had experienced with our families of origin. There's something special about tables. And part of what makes them special is that the table serves as a place of connection. When we take communion every week, we recommit ourselves not only to Christ, but to one another. 
We remember not only the risen Savior, but our oneness with all of the other Christians around the world who also approach this expansive table of love and forgiveness. Communion is a communal act. If you look up the definition of the word, you'll see several different definitions, um, each of which can help us understand this act. Of course, you'll find the familiar definition saying, the service of Christian worship at which bread and wine are consecrated and shared. But you'll also find a different definition, which says the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. The sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. Just by reading these definitions, we can tell that communion is meant to be more than just some rote activity that we mindlessly repeat week after week. We commune at this table not only with Christ, but with one another. Communion is rarely taken in private, if ever, and that is by design. It's something that we do when we come together, and it's an act of connection and a sign of relationship. Even in the rare instances in which we do take communion in our own home at, or on our own at home, we are joined in that moment by a chorus of other believers who join us in taking communion all throughout the world in more ways than we could ever count. We never really take communion alone. Our partaking from the same loaf is a reminder that there are to be no distinctions between any one of us. We all eat the same thing. It's a reminder that regardless of anything, we are welcome because we are all a part of the body of Christ and we are all in need of love and grace and connection and relationship. Communion is meant to be something that connects us with others rather than something that leads to more division. I wanna to close today with a poem from a pastor named Andrew King. First, I'm gonna get a drink of water. Okay, thank you. The poem is titled, The Table with No Edges. We will sit down where feet tire from the journey. We will sit down where grief bends the back. We will sit down under roofs wrecked by artillery. We will sit down where cries sound from cracked walls. We will sit down where heat beats like hammers. We will sit down where flesh shivers and cold. We will sit down where bread bakes on thin charcoal. We will sit down where there is no grain in baked fields. We will sit down with those who dwell in ashes. We will sit down in shadow and in light. We will sit down making friends out of strangers. We will sit down our cup filled with new wine. We will sit down and let love flow like language. We will sit down where speech needs no words. We will sit together at the table with no edges. We will sit to share one loaf in Christ's name in one world. Amen. And now we have a little deviation from what your program says, uh, if you have one, or bulletin. We're actually going to sing our next song. And so our next song is, oops, our next song is We. As we come to our time of prayer, um, is there anything particular that we want to lift up? I know we have a happy uh, praise report from Arlene that Marcy is home, um, so that's good. She still has a long road to recovery, but it's awesome to know that she is home now, so that's great. So that's Maggie's sister, Arlene's niece. Um, yeah, did you have something else? Also, I, my, my brother will be at uh, section here a poker because his grandson is in place in Colorado Springs. Yeah. So it, it, it'll happen without Marcia and Megan and myself. Yeah. It's a big relief. 
Yeah, so Arlene, there's been some um, uncertainty about how the the burial and remains of her brother would be handled, but they're starting to get it all straightened out. So she's feeling a big sigh of relief for that. It's it's good to know that he'll get the, the burial that he deserves. We'll pray that that all goes well. Yeah. Um, I know the elders kind of talked about it, but um, James and Kristen Moore, that we just told them in our prayer because she had a liver transplant, which is a huge deal. Yeah. You said it's James and Kristen, right? Yeah. So that's Ken Moore's son and daughter-in-law? Yeah. Yeah. So former pastor Ken Moore, uh, there was a liver transplant? Yeah. Yeah, liver transplant um, of one of his kids. So that's... Huh? James, James Chris, Kristen, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Kristen. Yeah. She had to have a liver transplant, so that's a huge thing. Obviously, <laughs> very scary, but yeah. Good to know that she got one, though. So at least there's that. It's just hoping it takes. Yes, and I think she also. This is on Facebook, but she also, uh, I think, was asking for prayers because she she got the liver, and then I think twenty percent of it went to like a young kid. Mm. and that kid always doing good too so, okay okay great well that's awesome so uh, Miranda had said that the part of the liver had gone to a young kid and so there were the two different people that she benefited from like 80 percent of it and then the kid got the other 20 percent so that's that's pretty cool to think that you're that you could give a gift that would go on to not only help one person but several and then first, yeah yeah and prayers for the person who donated that's the hard thing is yeah. What's good for, for one group of people can be very devastating for another. So, yeah. So definitely praying for everyone involved in that. That's such a big thing. So anyone else, anything else we should keep in our prayers this week in particular? Kurt's doing better. Mr. Larson's home. Okay, Mr. Larson's home. Uh, Mary's husband, Kurt, was having some medical stuff going on and infection, but he's doing better now and he's home. So thanks be to God for that. That was scary. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we will certainly keep those things in our prayers this week. And so please pray with me. God of compassion and mercy, we are your wounded and wounding children. We bring our wounded selves, our divided society, and our broken world seeking your healing and transforming grace. It's easy, as, it's easy for us to point the anger and blame at others. Yet we know that we all need your forgiveness. No one among us is without fault. And each of us in some way contributes to the division and conflict we see in our daily lives. We pray now not only for the victims of conflicts, but also for those that we have called enemies. Break down the walls of hatred and distrust and bitterness and open a way for us to reach one another in truth and love. Enable us to build a society where all can belong around your table of life, celebrating your feast of joy. We are but one part of your image on earth. As we take and eat the broken bread, we remember those from whom we are separated, whether by distance or division. As we take and drink the crushed grapes, we hold in prayer those whose lives have been devastated by earthquakes and hurricanes, by illness and violence, by war and conflict of all kinds. We remember that as your one body, the plights of those who also call themselves Christians, those who are our siblings, whether near or far, are just as important as our own struggles. Help us to see beyond the challenges that face us, recognizing that we are not the only people who matter and our struggles are no more important than the struggles of others. Help us to have compassion and empathy for our neighbors and help us to reach out to offer assistance whenever and wherever we can. In doing this, might we remember the way that your son Christ lived and model our own behavior after his. And now let us pray in the way that he taught us on the last night of his life, saying our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now another change in our bulletin. We're going to sing One Bread, One Body before communion. So please join me in that. Meditation says, the definition of communion is, well, since she's already shared that with you, I'll keep on going. But I think the part that I really was um, wanted to focus on was the sharing of thoughts and feelings, especially when on a spiritual level. There's been many a time that I have worked in ecumenical groups. Um, Family Promise is one of them. When I was a kid growing up in Yellowstone with Christian Ministries in the National Park, but this sense of communion, of true communion around a table really came home to me when Kurt and I were in India. We were there on a habitat trip and there were people on our team from United States, from Taiwan, from Singapore, and of course from Bangalore, India. And it was a big team, so we were split, split apart and would go to two different home sites to build. 
But then we would come back together every noon for the meal. And the meal was served out on the top of a roof of the house because many of these houses um, were small, but they had this rooftop that was open air because it's so warm that oftentimes this became another living space. So we would all gather and the person making the meal would bring all the food in and set it up. And they always made naan, that big round flatbread. But for some reason, I can't talk without using my hands. For some reason, they never cut it. They just made the naan and then several, several pieces of naan would be stacked together in foil. And it was somebody's job every day to use the hand sanitizer we have in building and tear the bread into pieces for everyone there. And that bread was very popular. Fresh hot naan was very popular, but there was always plenty to go around. And once we had torn the bread and people began to go through the food line to get their food, and we sat down and we communed. We talked about the joys of the morning build. We talked about the frustrations of the morning build. Sometimes there were tears because the, ha the habitat homeowner would be so grateful that she could see her kitchen emerging. Sometimes there would be a little bit of anger about lack of supplies. But we talked about it as we ate, as we communed together. We were not all Christians. There were a lot of Christians in that group, but there were also Hindu, and there was a Buddhist, and there was a Muslim, and we communed together over broken bread. And I know that Jesus calls us to this table to do in remembrance of him, to remember him. But I think when he says that, to remember him, to remember what he calls us to do in the world, to not just remember the night that he was betrayed, that is so important. But I think he calls us at this communion table to commune with our world. And now we will do that. We will come to this table, knowing that it's not only us who come here, but all of the believers around us. And we will remember Christ in the way that he taught us on the night when he was betrayed, the last night of his life. He gathered with all of his friends and all of his friends from many different backgrounds and beliefs. And I'm sure there was disagreements among that group, as there are in every group of believers. But he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body. It is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. So often as you drink of it, do this also in remembrance of me. For Christ said that every single time that we eat from this loaf or we drink from this cup, we proclaim to the whole world who he is, who he was, who he is always going to be forever. And now we remember that all are welcome at Christ's table. Will you join me in prayer? And this is going to be a call and response prayer. So when I take a pause, I would like you to pray all are welcome. Let us pray. Holy One, whether we're tall or whether we're short, whether we're young or whether we're old, all are welcome. You call us from far away. You call us from the you call us with problems. You call us with anxieties. You call us with joys. All are welcome. Holy God, we thank you that this table is open to all. And we thank you that you still in us that desire, that need to share your love with the world. All are welcome. Amen. Amen.
This morning on World Communion Sunday, there are so many ways that we can share our gifts. And as always, we need your gifts of time and talent and treasure here at First Christian Church so that we can share Christ's love with the world. But also, our region needs our prayers and our gifts, the Northern Lights region. So that's another place we can share our treasures, our time, and our talents. Global Ministries, which is very near and dear, of course, to my heart, because that's where Andrew works, which is a part of our general church. That's another way that we can give of our time, talent, and energy. And also, right now is the time that we are taking the reconciliation offering. And the reconciliation offering is about helping with justice. So many ways that we can give and share in grateful thanks to our holy God for what has been given to us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly one, we thank you for the treasures and the talents and the time that you have given us. Even when we feel that we just don't have enough time or treasure or talent, you help us see that there's always a way to share what you have given us in your precious name. Amen. And now we're going to have our last song which I don't know very well. So I would appreciate if you sang loud and proud. I'm gonna live so God can use me. Yeah, only heard it a few times, so <laughs> we'll try. <clears throat> So God can use me. I didn't say I was going to sing well. So. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> for our benediction today, you were called to this table. You were fed at this table. You were united at this table. Now you are sent from this table into all the world. Go, therefore, into the world with courage and love. Set a place for, for all who hunger. Fill the cup of all who thirst. Amen. Go in peace.